Chapter 38 What's wrong? asked Jonas when we arrived back at the shack. Nothing, dear, said Mother. Jonas looked from Mother to me, searching our faces for answers. We're just tired, Mother smiled. Just tired, I told Jonas. Jonas motioned us over to his pallet of straw. Inside his small cap were three large potatoes. He put his finger to his lips so our gasps wouldn't be audible. He didn't want Yelushka to take the potatoes for rent. Where did you get them? I whispered. Darling, thank you, said Mother. And I think we have just enough rainwater left. We'll make a nice potato soup. Mother grabbed the coat out of her suitcase. I'll be right back. Where are you going? I asked. To take food to Mr. Stallis, she said. I checked my suitcase, thinking of the dead man knifed up against the Colcott's office. My drawings were undisturbed. The lining on the bottom of my suitcase was held down by snaps. I tore each drawing and page of writing from my tablet and slid it under the lining and snapped it back in place. I would hide my messages to Papa until I found a way to send something. I helped Jonas set the water to boil, and then it occurred to me. Miss Grievous wasn't able to give us beets today. Mother didn't take a potato, so what was she feeding the bald man? I walked through the huts, and I quickly ducked out of sight. Mother was talking to Andrews in front of the bald man's shack. She was no longer holding her coat. I couldn't hear their conversation. Andrews looked concerned. He discreetly handed a bundle to Mother. She reached out and patted his shoulder. Andrews turned to leave. I ducked behind the shack. Once Mother passed, I peeked out and began to follow him. Andrews walked down the row of barracks. I stayed well behind, just close enough to see where he was going. He made his way to the edge of the camp, and then continued on to a large log building with windows. He stopped and looked around. I ducked behind the edge of a shack. It looked like Andrews entered the building from the rear. I crept closer and hid behind a bush. I squinted to peer in the window. A group of NKVDs sat around a table. I looked to the back of the building. No, Andrews couldn't have gone inside an NKVD building. I was just about to follow him farther, and then I saw her. Mrs. Arvidas appeared in the window carrying a tray of glasses. Her hair was cleaned and styled. Her clothes were pressed. She was wearing makeup. She smiled and distributed the drinks to the NKVD. Andrews and his mother were working for the Soviets. Chapter 39 I should have been grateful for the potato soup that night, but all I could think about was Andrews. How would he do it? How could he work with them? Did he live in that building? I thought about lying in that hole with Andrews while he laid in bed, a Soviet bed. I kicked at my itchy straw, staring at the rusted ceiling. Mother, do you think they'll let us sleep tonight, or will they insist we go to the office to sign the papers? asked Jonas. I don't know said Mother. She turned her head to me. Andrews gave me that nice bread we had with our soup. It's very courageous of him to take risks like that for us. Oh, he's courageous, isn't he? Oh, what do you mean by that? said Jonas. He is courageous. He gets us food nearly every day. Yeah, he sure looks like he's eating well, doesn't he? I think he's actually gained weight, I said. And be glad of that, said Mother. Be glad that not everyone is desperate for food like we are. Yes, I'm very glad the NKBD aren't hungry. If they were hungry, how would they have the strength to bury us alive? I said. What? said Jonas. Yelushka yelled at us to be quiet. Hush, Lena. Let's say our prayers and give thanks for that wonderful meal. And let's pray that your father is just as well. We slept through the night, and the next morning Officer Kretzky told Mother that we were to join the other women in the beet fields. I was thrilled. We bent and thrashed amongst the long green rows of sugar beets using hoes without handles. Miss Grebus lectured us on the pace of our work. She told us that on the first day, someone leaned down the handle a moment to wipe their brow. The Soviets made them saw the handles off. I realized how difficult it was for Miss Grievous to steal beets for us. Armed guards stood watch. 
and although they seemed more interested in smoking and telling jokes, slipping a beat into my underwear unnoticed was no easy task. It poked out like an extra limb. That evening, I refused to take food to Mr. Stollis. I told Mother I felt too sick to walk. I couldn't stand to see Andrews. He was a traitor. He was plump on Soviet food, eating from the hand that strangled us each and every day. I'll take Mr. Stollis his food, said Jonas after a few days. Nina, go with him, said Mother. I don't want him to go alone. I walked with Jonas to the bald man's shack, and Andrews was waiting outside. Hi, he said. I ignored him, left Jonas outside, and walked in to give Mr. Stollis his beats. He was standing up. There you are. Where have you been? he said, leaning up against the wall. I noticed Mother's coat tucked into his bed of straw. Disappointed I'm not dead, I said, handing him the beets. That's a sour mood, he said. Are you the only one who's allowed to be angry? I'm sick of this. I'm tired of the NKVD hounding us. Bah! They don't care if we sign. Do you really think they need our permission, our signatures, to do what they're doing to us? Stalin needs to break our will. Don't you understand? He knows if we sign some stupid papers, we'll give up. He'll break us. How do you know? I asked. He waved me away. It doesn't look good on you. Anger, he said. Now get out. I walked out of the shack. Let's go, Jonas. Wait, whispered Jonas, leaning into me. He brought us salami. I folded my arms across my chest. I guess she's allergic to kindness, said Andrews. That's not what I'm allergic to. Where did you get your salami? I said. Andrews stared at me. Jonas, can you leave us for a minute? He said. No, he can't leave us. My mother doesn't want him to be alone. That's the only reason I came, I said. I'm fine, said Jonas. He turned and walked away. So is that what you're eating these days, I asked. Soviet salami? When I get it, he said. He took out a cigarette and lit it. Andrews looked stronger, his arms muscular. He drew in a breath and blew a plume of smoke over our heads. And cigarettes, too. Are you sleeping in a nice bed in that Soviet building? You have no idea, he said. I don't? Well, you don't look tired or hungry. You weren't dragged to the Colcott's office in the middle of the night and condemned to 25 years, so are you reporting all of our conversations to them? You think I'm spying? Komarov asked Mother to spy and to report to him. She said no. You don't know what you're talking about said Andrews, the crimson in his face rising. I don't? No, you have no idea, he said. I don't see your mother working in the dirt. No, said Andrews, leaning in an inch from my face. You know why? A vein in his temple bulged, and I felt his breath on my forehead. Yes, because, because they threatened to kill me unless she slept with them. And if they get tired of her, they still might kill me. So how would you feel, Lena, if your mother felt she had to prostitute herself to save your life? My jaw dropped. The words flew out of his mouth. How do you think my father would feel if he knew? How does my mother feel lying with the men who murdered her husband? No, your mother might not translate for them, but what do you think she'd do if they held a knife to your brother's neck? Andrus, I... No, you have no idea. You have no idea how much I hate myself for putting my mother through this, how every day I think of ending my life so she can be free. But instead, my mother and I are using our misfortune to keep others alive. But you wouldn't understand that, would you? You're too selfish and self-centered. Poor you, digging all day long. You're just a spoiled kid. He turned and walked away. Chapter 40 The straw prickled against my face. Jonas had fallen asleep a long time ago. A soft whistle blew each time he exhaled. I tossed and turned. He's trying, Lena, said Mother. He is sleeping, I said. Oh, Andrews, he's trying and you're blocking him at every pass. Men aren't always graceful, you know. 
Mother, you don't understand, I said. She ignored me and continued. Well, I can see you're upset. Jonas said that you were nasty to Andrews. That's unfair. Sometimes kindness can be delivered in a clumsy way, but it's far more sincere in its clumsiness than those distinguished men you read about in books. Your father was rather clumsy. A tear rolled down my cheek. She chuckled in the darkness. He says I bewitched him the very instant he saw me, but do you know what really happened? He tried to talk to me, and he fell out of a tree. He fell out of an oak tree and broke his arm. Mother, it's not like that, I said. Costas, she sighed. He was so clumsy, but he was so sincere. Sometimes there is such beauty in awkwardness. There's love and emotion trying to express itself, but at the time it just ends up being awkward. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm, I said, trying to muffle my tears. Good men are often more practical than pretty, said Mother. Andrews just happens to be both. I couldn't sleep. Each time I closed my eyes, I saw him winking at me, his beautiful face coming toward mine. The smell of his hair lingered around me. Are you awake? I whispered. Joanna rolled over. Yes, it's too hot to sleep, she said. I feel like I'm spinning. He's so handsome, I told her. She giggled, tucking her arms under her pillow. And he dances even better than his older brother. How did we look together? I asked. Like you were having a great time? Everyone could see that. I can't wait to see him tomorrow, I sighed. He's just perfect. The next day after lunch, we ran back to the cottage to brush our hair, and I nearly ran over Jonas on my way out. Where are you going? he asked. For a walk, I said, rushing after Joanna. I walked as fast as I could without breaking into a jog, and I tried not to crumple the drawing rolled in my hand. I decided to draw him when I couldn't sleep. The portrait came out so well that Johanna suggested I give it to him, and she assured me he'd be impressed with my talent. His brother rushed up to Johanna, meeting her in the street. Hey, stranger, he said, smiling at Johanna. Hi, said Johanna. Hi, Lena. What do you have there? he said, motioning to the paper in my hand. Joanna looked over toward the ice cream shop, and I moved around her to find him. Alina, she said, reaching out to hold me back. But it was too late. I had already seen. My prince had his arm around a girl with red hair. They were cozy, laughing, sharing an ice cream cone. My stomach plunged and twisted. I forgot something, I said, backing away. My fingers wrenched the portrait in my sweaty hand. I'll be right back. I'll come with you, said Joanna. No, that's all right, I said, hoping the blotches of heat I felt on my neck weren't visible. I attempted to smile. The sides of my mouth trembled. I turned and walked away, trying to keep my composure until I reached a safe distance. Clenching my jaw didn't stop the tears. I stopped and leaned against a trash can on the street. Lena! Joanna caught up, Joanna caught up to me. Are you all right? I nodded. I opened the crinkled portrait of his handsome face. I ripped it up and threw it away. Stray pieces escaped my grip and blew across the street. Boys were idiots. They were all idiots.